Good morning. It is a wonderful morning. It's so good to be with you today to worship God with you and to reflect on his word together this morning. And I'll be looking at a passage in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. You've been so gracious and kind in many conversations that uh, we have had together, and I look forward to our Q&A time following this. I'm always energized by those kinds of uh, meetings, uh, always, almost always, uh, energized by those kinds of meetings, and I anticipate that'll be true today, so very much look forward to it. First Thessalonians, uh, especially 1, 2, and 3, uh, uh, wonderful, is a wonderful example of the healthy patterns and practices of a healthy church. And um, uh, chapter 2 talks to us uh, about Christian leadership, uh, particularly pastoring, and the Apostle Paul uses a couple of metaphors that remind us that pastoring is a lot like parenting. In fact, you may have picked up, I have a sense of humor about a variety of things. I try not to be irreverent, but I even think Scripture is funny at times. Some people uh, find that offensive. I'm, I'm sorry if you do, but I'm still going to laugh. First, then, First Thessalonians 2.7, for instance, I think is funny, because I believe it is in, the, it is in that verse, yeah, that Paul, uh, Apostle Paul likens himself to a mother who is nurturing and caring and loving. And i got to be honest, somehow when I think of the Apostle Paul, the image of a nurturing mom does not come to my mind. I just, I just think it's funny that he would use that. I, I don't disagree with him. I just think, oh, seriously, Paul? You? <laughs> I know my mother and don't see you, man, as that. But he gives us this marvelous metaphor, actually, of Christian leadership and says, I was among you gentle, like a mother, nurturing, caring. And uh, I believe it's the following verse where he says, and I, I loved you so much that I just gave my own life for you. And he lays out this marvelous imagery of a mother who is nurturing, caring, and selflessly giving for her children. And he says Christian leadership is like that. But I really want to focus attention down today, uh, 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 beginning at verse 11, where he switches that imagery to that of a father. And so obviously this is transcending gender. He's saying this, 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 this Christian leadership uh, involves both the mothering and the fathering, the parenting uh, analogy that he's using here. And he says in verse 11, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, Catch this, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. When I first engaged with this passage, I have to admit that I didn't do well. When I first engaged, I, 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 I said I was alone, so I said, I think, out loud, no, that's backwards. Now, that's a rather stupid thing to say about Scripture. Let's just acknowledge that, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll admit that right up front. So I looked at it again. What I, what I was referencing was that, that trilogy of encouraging, comforting, urging. Uh, encouraging and comforting, I think, are, are just really good translations and easy. The urging you may know, can be translated reprove, rebuke, uh, confront, uh, exhort. Uh, it's an in-your-face kind of a phrase. And as I looked at this trio, I said, nope, you got it upside down. And then rather quickly, <laughs> perhaps spirit-led, said, hmm, or we do, which is a much better answer, by the way. And, but then I said, but, but fathers tend to do this in reverse. They don't lead with encouragement. They lead with reproof and rebuke. And I continue to reflect on that. My father, 
who was an excellent man in many, many ways, in many ways a godly man, and I'm confident he's in heaven today, and so I do not intend disrespect to him. But my father didn't do it this way. He was upside down. My father was stellar at urging. Reproving, rebuking, exhorting, however you want to translate it, my dad was grade A. He was up there. Man, he could do this with the best of them. Decent at comforting, actually. Not good at all at encouraging. At least not to me. I've heard other people tell me that my father bragged to them about me, but I never heard it, like ever. I never recall hearing him tell me that he was proud of me or happy or proud about something I'd done. I'm okay, by the way. A warm hug would be good sometime, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to make it. But I miss that. I still miss that. Now, I'm going to cut my dad some slack. One of the things is he was simply imitating the kind of parenting he had received. Okay? And I'll reference that. Many of us do that. Second, he was part of a generation where that was a common style of parenting. My parents' generation had, it seemed like one of their, one of their prime goals for their children was that we would not be spoiled, arrogant, or conceited. And in my opinion, they overachieved. It was my generation that invented the phrase low self-esteem. We didn't quite invent, but we popularized the concept of, uh, of inferiority complex. <laughs> and we weren't the first in generation to have either one of those, but we came up with those phrases and made them common nomenclature for the culture, right? And when I speak about this to especially people of my generation, I, they lean in, they identify, they, mm, yeah. Hmm. So, so fast forward, I become a parent, and uh, I have three sons, and... Um, very annoyingly, I find myself imitating my father. The stuff I hated, I'm now doing. Hello? And so I, re I, I, I read this passage, and I looked at it and said, nope, it's upside down, but rather quickly made that to, no, I'm upside down. I'm doing this all wrong. I'm leading with urging, I'm sometimes never getting around to encouraging. So as a communicator, I've got a couple of goals this morning. I want to teach a principle and practice from Scripture that, this is going to sound grandiose, but it's not, that if you get, it will become a force multiplier in your life and certainly in your leadership and influence. It's a huge deal. I'm also going to model a practice that, if you get, might become a real help for you in intentional spiritual growth. But I won't have time to teach that. I'll just tell about it, and you're sharp. You'll pick it up. If, if we do what this passage indicates, by the way, it makes all kinds of logical sense. In any human relationship, here's the deal. If you lead with encouragement, it opens the door for the more intimate, personal thing of comfort. That makes sense? And then it gives you a platform from which to confront, to urge, to reprove, rebuke. If you lead with reproof, you probably will hit a wall through which you cannot go. You'll never get to comfort. You'll never get to encourage. If you lead with urging, you probably will stop with urging. But if you lead with encouragement, 
It will open all kinds of doors for you. In leadership and influence, pastoring is like parenting. Christian leadership is like parenting. If a father encourages, we will accept the reproof from one who loves us and values us and wants the best from us. The Bible, (laughs) surprise, surprise, makes great sense. I don't know if you figured this out or not, but God's very bright. His word is extraordinarily wise. Amen? And so, so he's not upside down. We are upside down. And when you lead with encouragement, it opens the doors in wonderful, wonderful ways. L- l- let me give you an example. I have, a, I have a practice in life where understanding my central core and mission before God, uh, each year I take a day alone with God, uh, one of the days alone with God, uh, typically right after the beginning of a calendar year, right around that time. And the focus of that day is spending time in the Word and prayer, but asking God to direct my thoughts as to a spiritual growth goal for that coming year. Um, At this rate, I'm going to live to be 180 because I've got a lot of stuff to work on. But I have discovered that if I try to grow in 12 or 15 areas all at once, I don't do any of them. But if I can be God-directed to identify one or two key areas of spiritual growth, I can, by the grace of God, allow him to further sanctify me in that area. Does that make sense? So this was one of those days where I felt directed of God, and I don't know how mystical you are. Um, Something like a, uh, what Bill Hybels phrase, God whispers, uh, whatever. Um, However you sense the presence of God, I will tell you, it is a science and an art. This is more art. I was, I was in the Word of God. I, this is obviously uh, never contradicts that. I was in prayer before God and listening before God. And a day alone with God allows me time to unpack and shut up after a while and listen. And so in listening to him, uh, it, it became aware to me, I became aware that the, the project I needed to work on was to become an encouraging person. Hmm. I was pastoring a rather large church at that time, leading a staff, all of those kinds of things, so that made sense to me. Yes, I need to do that. I, I tend to be a focused person. Some would even use the term driven. They were wrong, of course, but they would use that term. And I needed to work on becoming more of, a folk, of an encouraging person. So I worked through that. I agreed with that. I wrote out that goal for the year. I will just tell you that practice involves then that I would engage my prayer partners in that to say, God wants me to become a more encouraging person. Would you join me in praying about that? I commit to praying about that every day. Uh, I began searching scripture and anything else, and God does marvelous things for me. For instance, in about a month later, the uh, leadership journal uh, uh, came out with a whole uh, issue around how to be an encouraging leader, which I just thought was funny. I just looked up and said, nice. So, so uh, uh, that may be pure coincidence, I doubt it, but anyway... Uh, um, Uh, I began to pull that together and allow God's spirit to transform me both intellectually and spiritually to become a more encouraging person. I sensed that day, however, that God would also like to apply this to a very specific target. For that first year, a very specific target of that strategy for that was that I would encourage my wife out loud, on purpose, every day, each day, for a year. Now, some of you husbands are saying, what, you weren't already doing that? Yeah, whatever, give me a break. (laughs) Now, I've never been a guy that, that struggles with the classic man thing of, I can't say the words, I love you. I've, I've, say that rather often. 
I thought I was a decently affirming husband, to be honest. I thought I was pretty good. As it turns out, not so much. I first thought this is going to be one of the easiest piece of cake assignments I've ever had from God. And the first week was. Somewhere early in the second week, though, it began to dawn on me that I really didn't have that much material. And I was thinking, I bet she's going to catch on. Your hair looks nice today. Wow, you're a good cook, and that's a good outfit. I'm betting if I repeat that over and over for a year, she's going to notice that this is all I've got. <laughs> and so I begin to say, oh, God, help me. Now what do I do? I've used up all my stuff. So it forced me to do a couple of things, actually more than that. But, but, but one is I had to really pay attention. My wife is this amazing woman. I knew that. But until I really started noticing, I just didn't know how good. Wow, she does a lot of good stuff. And I had to pay attention to what she does and then frame that in like a sentence, paragraph, and say it out loud every day for a year. It was an awesome year. We've never gone back to the same. As you might imagine, my wife had a good year. And when mama's happy, oh, <laughs> life's good. It was a good year. It was a good year of growth for me. It started a pattern and a practice of becoming intentional about that. As a father, which of course this passage deals with, as a, as a, as a father and as a pastor at the time, a Christian leader at the time too, I, had, I was in the middle of this laboratory of, of saying this passage works. I was watching it every day at home with my wife and as a father... I, I, this has been some years ago, and, and I, was, I was saying, so I need to affirm my sons as well as reprove them. And so I started being proactive about encouraging them. And then I believe it was James Dobson that, that, that first told me this number. I've seen it many places since. You know it well probably. But, 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 but the whole statistic that it takes five affirmations to equal one criticism. When I heard that, it was a bad day in my life. One of my first thoughts was, my boys just don't do that many good things. And they need some reproving. So, man, five to one? Seriously, I can't do this. And then my second thought was, wow, I've really got to pay attention. When my boys do something right, I've got to affirm this. So I sort of build up coins, you know, because I'm not giving up this one. <laughs> <laughs> they need it. I mean, you should beat my boys. <laughs> Praise God, they're wonderful, godly men serving God today. I have a great adult relationship with them. My, my, one of my follow-up thoughts was, you know, some of this stuff, maybe I've got to let it slide. I've got to pick and choose the stuff I urge and reprove about, making sure I get this. I'm not pretending that I got the perfect balance here, okay? But I did a lot better than I had been doing. And I watched my sons just change by that. It was amazing. Freaked them out to start with. <laughs> it was amazing. They were like, oh boy, this is dangerous. What just happened to dad? There's got to be a plot here somewhere, <laughs> which I thought was funny. I watched it happen in my leadership. Uh, year two, I'm back on the mountain alone with God, and, and he gives me another spiritual project. But as it turns out, indicates to me that I'm not done with this encouraging thing and wants to give me another specific target. And I came away from there with one of the most fun spiritual growth goals and strategies I've ever done in my life. It was awesome. That, that, after that, that second year, I came to say my focus of being coming in an encouraging person is this, that every week for this year, this coming year, every week, I will out loud intentionally affirm, encourage, five kids who are 12 or under every week of this coming year. 
Now, I was pastoring a rather large church at this time, so right away I knew I need help, so I enlisted people. Uh, any, anybody on our staff, uh, all the secretaries in our staff, school teachers in our, in our congregation, anybody that hung out with kids at all, I said to them, here what God has impressed me that I need to be doing this year. I need to affirm five kids who are 12 or under each week, and I need help. Uh, so if you ever catch a kid doing anything good, uh, let me know. I want to know. Which, by the way, had a ripple effect through our congregation. It was absolutely amazing. I started getting clippings. I started getting postings. I, 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 just, I started getting the word from a lot, and I would just go connect with kids. And I just, you know, something could be as simple as, wow, man, that's a cool shirt. Man, man yeah, it looks sharp. It could be that trivial to things that were much more significant than that and talking to them about how I was seeing God's gifting and God's grace at work in their lives and seeing the future and the potential in their lives. And I thought kids were responding rather well to that, but I, I, I always had this wonder. Part of the reason, by the way, where I think people aren't better encouragers is we sort of had this idea nobody really cares. This doesn't matter to people. They don't care that I say nice stuff to them. It doesn't make a big difference. That is so wrong. Here's how I knew that. It was just a few weeks into this experiment when, when I was standing around after our last service on Sunday. We had a, we had a large foyer area, and, and I was standing around with a group of, oh, I don't know, 15 adults or 20 adults, something like that. We, we sort of arranged in a circle for some reason. We're just standing there chatting about who knows what. And, and this is after church, and it was a fairly nice day outside, and I just noticed out of the corner of my eye kids hanging around. And I thought, well, this is weird. Because young kids do not hang around and listen to boring adults talk. Especially after they've been cooped up in Sunday school and church and stuff for the morning. And it's a decent day. They are out of there, right? So here they were, and they weren't talking to each other. They were just, they had formed a circle outside of our circle, and they were just hanging out. And I thought, what's up with that? And then it dawned on me, ah, these kids are waiting for their encouragement fix. So I excused myself from the circle of adults and walked out and started walking around this circle and just tap a shoulder and would just say a sentence of encouragement. They'd stand up straighter, they were gone. And I made the rounds of that whole circle and dawned on me, wow, that's way more important than I thought it would be. It saddened me to say that I may be the only adult in that kid's life who is encouraging and affirming her. I'm sorry about that. They didn't have terrible parents, most of them, a couple of them did, but they just had parents that were busy and thoughtless. They didn't have bad teachers. Some of them did. They just had teachers who didn't have time to do that. I've never been impressed with any position I've ever had. But they were. I was the dude that got up on Sunday and preached up front. In their minds, I had a title of senior pastor. Uh Uh-huh. Doesn't impress my dog, but it impressed them. <laughs> they thought I had some importance. By the way, if you're eight and somebody's 14, she's important just for being 14. Seriously, if you're a child and you look at an adult, they have stature, literally, gravitas. You don't know that word, but you get it. They have standing to encourage you. I've studied a lot about the power of position. And position gives you very little power, but one that's very important. Position gives you the power to encourage. Position gives you the power of leverage. Please never take yourself or your position seriously, but never forget that other people do. Leverage it. 
The Apostle Paul said, I was among you like a father, encouraging, comforting, urging you. The power to encourage is exponential when you have position. When you are called pastor, the power to encourage, because it's sort of like God just spoke to me. We are ambassadors of Christ. Hello? I've had the privilege of hanging out with many uh, really high capacity, high, highly effective leaders. And I often work into the conversation a bit of an interview question. <laughs> and I will say to them, when did you first become aware that you could be an influencer, a leader, a shaper in the kingdom of God? And I find, almost without exception, they'll give me their absolute full attention and they'll talk to me about a moment. Usually it is an adult other than a parent who speaks into their life. I remember mine. I'm grateful to have had a few, but I remember an older pastor who took time out for a 12-year-old kid. And I thought it was strange because he had an important meeting he could have been a part of. And he hung out with me for a while. And I remember him placing, we were sitting together on the front pew of a church and he grabbed my knee and he said, son, God's going to do some important stuff through you. And I had two thoughts in my mind. I don't think so. If you knew me, I don't think you'd think so. But the other thought was, seriously? Really? You think? Could be? Seriously? And he gave me a few words of advice. This was just kind of a long paragraph. I can remember it word for word. I went away saying, hmm, that's possible? Well, if so, I ought to shape up. I ought to, like, discipline some things. Mm -hmm. Lots of things. If that's possible. It was a tipping point. One of my prayers is, God, help me never go by a 12-year-old kid for whom I could be that same kind of a blessing. Here's the good news. You can't waste it. You cannot waste encouragement. I could go on with my projects, but I'm not, I'll end it there. But I, I will tell you that that's been a huge blessing in life. I would say this as a preacher. I would say it as a pastor. I would say it as a parent. I would say it as any kind of a leader or influencer. Lead with encouragement. We had a wonderful story just a few minutes ago about a lawnmower. I love that story about valuing a person and inviting men for a meal. That's encouraging. <laughs> and you wind up giving him a lawnmower. It's huge. And you encourage this entrepreneur, worker, you value him as a person. It's amazing to me. One of my projects later on was, was valuing the people who serve me. People in restaurants and filling stations and it's amazing the value of looking them in the eye. I told you I'd quit, but I lied. Um, <laughs> I got one more story that you, you need to hear. There, there, there's a restaurant in a city where I'm, I'm fairly often, and it's a restaurant I like, and I take pastors there, et cetera, and um, we pray before we eat, um, and I try, to, uh, I try to be nice and respectful. I tip appropriately, generously, but not extravagantly. But I try, to be, I try to be encouraging. So if a waiter or a waitress is serving, I try not to lie. But if they're doing a good job, I let them know that you, you do well. You really do your job well. I try, if I can, to read their name and call them by name and actually look at them and be polite and nice and say thank you every time they refill my glass. Now, Part of that, that's not hero stuff, right? 
But this is not rocket science. It is not heavy lifting. Nothing I just said to you is difficult, but it is unusual. I'm embarrassed to go out to eat sometimes with Christians. I don't want us to pray. Not because I don't want to be grateful to God, but because I don't want anybody in the restaurant to know we're Christians. Because they've been rude. And I don't want the name of Jesus to be smeared by my or our rude behavior. So, back to this restaurant. I was there on a Sunday, and um, a waitress who was not our waitress came by, and she said to me, Pastor, and that piqued my interest. I did not know she knew I was a pastor. She said, um, I'm very, very, very sorry. I don't want to interrupt, but could, could I just ask you to pray for something for me? <laughs> I was going, yeah. And, and she saw my look a little, and she said, you know you're our pastor, don't you? I said, no, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. She said, oh, yeah. She said, we all know who you are. We've checked you out. <laughs> That's a little scary. <laughs> and she said, when you come in on Sunday... She said, we don't confuse you that you're God, but when you come in on Sunday, we sort of have this sense, oh, God is here. God pays attention to us. We work on Sunday. We don't get to go to church very much at all. And when you come in, it's a sense of God cares for us. Blew me away. Had no idea. So she gave me her prayer request, and I prayed for her. And before that day was over, another waitress came by and said, I'm so sorry, I don't mean to interrupt us. You're, you're cool. And she gave me a prayer request. And I went out there saying, wow. But I, I, I guarantee you, you, you know, I'm not the only pastor who eats there. And all I did was say please and thank you. It's really not that hard. Hello? I do not deserve a reward for that. I do get extra good service, by the way, <laughs> which is, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but I'm telling to you, ladies and gentlemen, God's word has an amazing principle here. As a parent or a leader, lead with encouragement. Then you'll get to comfort. And then when you need to, you'll be able to say to someone, hey, don't do that again. That was really stupid. You're smart, but that wasn't. And they'll say thank you. Almost always, really. I have those conversations <laughs> with pastors and people. Don't do that again. Or call me first. Really, seriously? Don't call me to pick up after you. Call me before you do something dumb like that next time. <laughs> but you know I love you, and I'm on your team, and I believe God's going to do wonderful things through you. It gives you the platform for reproving. Amen? Hmm. Let me wrap up. Father, just seal this your word to us, I pray. Thanks so much for encouraging us. You lead with love and grace, not with condemnation and rebuke. Thank you. Help us to be Christ followers. In his name we pray it.